KSAT 12. The news at noon starts right now. A group of Republican lawmakers are wrapping up a visit to the southern border. The group led by Representative Steve Scalise from Louisiana. They toured the Donna Migrant Processing Facility and the Border Wall in McAllen, Texas. Now they are in Mission, Texas, and we'll discuss what they've seen so far. We've got live streams going on the comments online on KSAT.com. The allegations of abuse and understaffing inside the Freeman Coliseum's Expo Hall, where migrant teens are being housed, still being investigated by the Texas Rangers. Meanwhile, some other lawmakers are in town today to take a look at the facility here for themselves. Congressman Joaquin Castro, Representative Trey Martinez Fisher, and Texas House members visiting the shelter this afternoon. The lawmakers plan to hold a news conference around 4.30. Following their visit, we're going to bring you updates in our later newscasts. And also new at noon, Governor Greg Abbott sent a letter to Vice President Kamala Harris demanding the federal government shut down the unaccompanied minor facility at the Freeman Coliseum Expo Center. The letter includes a summarization of the allegations of sexual assault, bullying, understaffing at the facility. In a statement, HHS says that it takes the allegations seriously and is continuing to investigate and will take the proper measures. Families in cars sitting bumper to bumper for hours waiting for help to feed their families. That was the science, the scene exactly one year ago today in what would become the San Antonio Food Bank's largest food distribution event. The long line served as a stark reminder of the economic crisis and hunger brought on by the pandemic. And today, the San Antonio Food Bank is commemorating the date and spotlighting some of those families that remain clients. Our Lisa Barrera. I mean, I'm sorry, Alicia Barrera is live from Trader's Village with more on today's event. Alicia. Good afternoon, David. Well, during this time last year, we were three weeks into the shutdown. And for so many families already in those three weeks, there was so much uncertainty of their lives, including when or how they'd be able to pay for their next meal. So in partnership with Traders Village, the San Antonio Food Bank made the call to host the drive through distribution event after their phones continued to ring off the hook and they confirmed they did have enough food on hand to help thousands. But little did they know that instead of five or six thousand, 10,000 families would show up to the parking lot of Traders Village here on the south side. The images of families securing food for their loved one went on to make headlines nationally and globally. Some waited bumper to bumper for five to six hours to just get a taste of normalcy and be able to fit, fill their fridge and pantry with groceries that would last them about a month. One of those people was 83-year-old Emma Ortega. She was present at today's commemoration event in representation of all the families Ortega was alone in her car that day waiting to pick up food after her nephews signed her up for the event. She admitted she felt a little embarrassed that day that she was in line, but felt at ease once she was greeted by volunteers. And not only did the food she received that day help her prevent from worrying about food, she was also able to share it with neighbors who weren't able to leave their homes that day. But today it reminds me of the work that the food bank is doing helping so many people, so, so many people, and really in need of that food. And, um, and it's hard to think that here we are, the richest country, and our people are hurting for food. Ortega hopes people don't forget that there are still families out there struggling. There are still children who face hunger due to the pandemic. And that day, family, friends, coworkers, even neighbors, so many people from different walks of lives and some even for the first time lined up that day and continue to show up to these food distributions. And of course, no one really imagined the severity um, the pandemic would have and still has on families here in our community. So if there's still families out there that need some help, you're asked to reach out directly to the San Antonio Food Bank. That way you can receive assistance. Um, and just so you know, Ms. Emma Ortega, she was here today. We heard from her. She's in good spirits and she does continue to receive those boxes of food. And she just wants to say thank you so much to all the volunteers who are able to make this happen. Reporting live, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. 
Hard to believe it was a year ago. Thank you, Alicia. Thousands of people expected to return to Atascos County this weekend as well for the Poteet Strawberry Festival. As a result, it's been designated as a no refusal weekend. Samuel King explains what that means and what law officers are going to be expecting of you. A no refusal weekend means anyone arrested for driving while intoxicated will be required to submit a breath or blood sample. Texas DPS, TxDOT, the Atascosa County Attorney's Office, and the 81st Judicial District Attorney's Office were all combining for the effort. The festival will be one of the first major events in the region since the pandemic began. And while officials say they want people to have fun, they also want people to be safe. They say the no refusal weekend is intended to help keep intoxicated drivers off road ways protecting all travelers. It's important because DWI is one of the most selfish offenses that are committed because you, what you're doing is jeopardizing every other human being that's on the roadway. If a suspected drunk driver refuses to take a breath test at the scene during the no refusal period, law enforcement will get a search warrant for a blood sample, which will be conducted at Methodist Hospital South in Jordanton. Officials say if you do plan to drink alcohol, designate a driver or plan for alternate transportation. Drivers should also keep other safety measures in mind, like moving over for stopped emergency vehicles and pack your patience because there will be plenty of traffic. Samuel King, KSAT 12 News. The police union and the city continue with police contract negotiations today. Meanwhile, voters in the May 1st city election will have to decide on Prop B. It would take away police officers' bargaining rights. During a debate last night, Fix SAPD argued the more open negotiations under a meet and confer system would be the quickest route to police reform. The San Antonio Police Officers Association argued that reform can be achieved through collective bargaining acts. You can watch last night's debate on Proposition B on KSET.com. A family disagreement has become a family violence case. Bear County Sheriff's investigators looking for a man who they say shot his sister. It happened on Grapevine Street, not far from Petranco and Loop 1604. As Katrina Weber reports, the woman is expected to survive. Deputies rope off the area near a home in the 11,900 block of Grapevine Street, hoping to contain the results of trouble between two members of a West Bear County family. Inside a woman's home is where they say her brother shot her during an argument just before 8 this morning. She was wounded in the shoulder, then taken to a hospital. Deputies say her brother took off leaving in a vehicle. Early on, there was some confusion in this case. The sheriff's office originally told us this involved a woman and her son, but later they learned that the suspect is actually her brother. With help from San Antonio police, the sheriff's office was able to search for him from the sky. They didn't find him right away. They also didn't share a description of the man or his car at that time, nor were they able to say exactly what allegedly set him off. Investigators may be able to get some answers from the woman who is expected to recover. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Still to come this up. Some record challenging heat today, plus a fire danger out west. Red flag warnings in place. We've got the latest coming up. The Spurs are trying to turn things around tonight in Denver after losing Wednesday. See if they can pull off a win tonight. we got the preview coming up. Meantime, people in the UK mourning after the death of Prince Philip. Now condolences are coming in from all over the world. We have details after the break. The United Kingdom mourning the death of Prince Philip, who married Queen Elizabeth more than 70 years ago, even before she became the monarch. The Duke recently returned home to Windsor after a month in a hospital following an infection. ABC's Julian McFarland has more from London. Prince Philip died Friday morning in Windsor Castle at the age of 99, leaving behind his now widow, Queen Elizabeth, after 73 years of marriage. Buckingham Palace lowering its flags to half-staff, releasing a statement reading, It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen has announced the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. He passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. The royal family joined with people around the world in mourning his loss. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson reacting to the news, he said, with great sadness. So we mourn today with Her Majesty the Queen, 
we offer our condolences to her and to all her family. Tributes now pouring in from not just across Britain, but from around the world and the Commonwealth, to which Prince Philip dedicated much of his life in service. Born into the Greek royal family, but later exiled from Greece, Philip eventually landed in England, joining the British Royal Navy at age 18, and soon after meeting a young Princess Elizabeth, whom he married in 1948. Take thee, Philip. Take thee, Philip. The couple had four children, Charles, the current heir to the throne, Anne, Andrew and Edward. The Queen honoured Prince Philip during the Golden Jubilee celebrations, marking her 50 years on the throne. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. At 96, the palace announced the prince would be withdrawing from public life, putting his royal feet up after 70 years of public service. Now begins an official period of 30 days of mourning for the British royal family. Queen Elizabeth called him her rock. She will now reign alone. Leaders from around the world have marked Philip's passing and this morning President Biden offered his condolences, paying tribute to his decades of devoted public service, adding Jill and I are keeping the Queen and Prince Philip's children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren in our hearts during this time. Julia McFarlane, ABC News, London. Outside with live camera, looking for some relief from this, uh, from this oak pollen stuff. Any insight? Is it over? Uh, is your mic on? Oh, that's okay, over. he's saying the oak season is not over. Oh, turn but your mic I, off, Dan. I, I just noticed that my car didn't have quite <laughs> the two inches yes. of yellow junk on it. Uh, not yet. Oak season is not over yet, but the number did come down a little bit today. See? So that's the, that's the positive. I noticed. Positive news. Yes. Uh, aquifer is down quite a bit, 1.2 feet. This thing's dropping like a rock. We need some rain in the worst way. Not expecting much today, but maybe, just maybe next week, it does look a little bit better. And we mentioned the pollen count. Oak is in the very high category, 16,840 molds are low. Hopefully that number keeps dropping. We'll talk about our chance for a few thunderstorms out east today. Also a fire weather threat off to the west. Forecast is coming up. Cooling centers will be open today across San Antonio. We've got a full list of all the locations right now on KSAC.com. All cooling centers will take precautions because of the pandemic, so that means you have to wear your mask. There will be temperature screenings and social distancing will be required. We were talking earlier today that how crazy our weather is because a month and a half ago we had warming centers. <laughs> Right? Yeah, we were freezing to death. Now we have cooling centers. It's hard to wrap your mind around, honestly. In a month I, and a half. And we're, we're going to get close to some records today, although I'll tell you, we're a little bit behind schedule as far as temperatures are concerned. So that may bode well for us when we're talking about heat this afternoon. Right now, we're starting to see the clouds clear. It's 79. There's still quite a bit of humidity in place, so that's going to keep temperatures from just really jumping up. But once we get our dry air, you're going to see a rapid rise in these uh, daytime temperatures. Right now we're forecasting 97. Don't know if we'll get there again because we're a little bit behind schedule as it stands right now. Southerly winds seven, uh, nine miles per hour, gusting 17. Though it is going to be a little bit breezy today. Temperatures around the area. Most of us are starting to transition into the 80s here. 81 Stinson, 80 Port SA, 80 out at Los Maples. You go west, the numbers are really starting to heat up. 84 Del Rio, 81 in Rock Springs, 83 Gonzales, 84 Kennedys. So there's a lot of warm numbers already. And here is the forecast highs. Uh, remember, we're uh, projecting 97 here. I do think we'll see some triple digits out west, but this is all dependent on dry air. We're still waiting for that dry line to sweep east, and that's going to make a big difference with those temperatures. What I can tell you for sure is that it will cool down as we get into tomorrow morning, down into the 60s, maybe even 50s in some spots. It'll feel a lot better tomorrow morning, and tomorrow will be nice too. Highs in the 80s. Drier air it is going to be a bit breezy, if not windy, for a few hours tomorrow morning. There's a look at the satellite picture. Cloud cover has now shifted out of San Antonio, so we're going to get full sun here soon. And again, that will only help to boost the temperatures. Meantime, severe weather now underway across parts of far northeast Texas, northern Louisiana and southern Arkansas. Severe thunderstorm warnings now starting to take shape there, and that's going to be an area that we'll see quite a bit of severe weather today. Here is the setup. 
There is the dry line I mentioned. It is now through Del Rio. The dew point has dropped off there. It will work its way east. As it does, dew points will quickly fall off. And San Antonio will probably be right on the dividing line, if not a little bit on the dry side. And that's why we're expecting, again, the heat. We're also worried about fire concerns out west. I'll show you that in just a second. But in this area where you see all the moisture uh, with dew points in the 60s and 70s, that's where we could see some stronger storms today. There is a marginal risk extending from Houston up to Dallas. Higher risk is going to be in parts of Louisiana and Mississippi. So we're right on the edge of things here. We could see a storm or two across our eastern counties, but the chance is pretty low. Now on the west side of this dry line, we've got the dry air, the gusty winds. Red flag warnings are in effect. This is going to go until 7 p.m. A high fire threat because humidity will be as low as 7 percent. and You'll get a gusty west wind, so something else to watch. Here's the forecast. The dry line progresses east. There are those storms I was speaking of. This model has been pretty consistent in breaking out an isolated storm or two around Austin and off to the north and east. If we do see that, they would likely be strong storms. Then the uh, dry line retreats a little bit, but we get a cold front that sweeps through tomorrow morning. Again, it will be windy right behind the front and it will cool down some and uh, we'll see a pretty nice weekend. It's actually looking really good. The other bit of good news is that we're expecting some rain chances as we get into next week. 97 degrees today it does cool off into the 80s by 10 o'clock and then by tomorrow morning, 62. 83 on your Saturday, 88 Sunday, and the next week looks a little more active. We'll get rain chances Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Temperatures will be quite a bit cooler too, and hopefully we'll get to boost some of those rain chances and maybe get a few downpours around the area. Guys. Oh, I hope so. Thank you so much. Yep. The Spurs need to clean up a few things before they tip off against the Nuggets again tonight. And we sit down with one of the stars of the Women's National Championship team. April has been a rough month so far. Oak Pollard, winless streak. Not good for anybody, especially the Spurs. Winless so far this month, nine days in. 0-4 after losing 106-96 at Denver Wednesday. Nikola Dunn. Jukic had 25 points, 10 assists, 9 rebounds to help the Nuggets win their 7th in a row. That's currently the longest winning streak in the NBA. Coach Pop said too many of his guys played poorly and that bench really needs to step up. And the Spurs had a shoot around today so they can try and work out a way to turn things around tonight. Watch some film as a team, as an individual and see what we did wrong. I think it was more so competing. You know, we gave up as far as uh, they getting a lot of re-second chances and, you know, the referees uh, getting in the way. Uh, you got to play through it. We got to play through it. We got to toughen up and play for 48 minutes. You know what I mean? So watch some film and be ready to go. It's the NBA. You know, we play them again. Yeah, and did you see this? Nuggets head coach Mike Malone lost it the second quarter Wednesday night. He got two technical fouls and ejected with 532 left in the first half for yelling at officials following a Jokic turnover. He's not pleased with the lack of calls for his big man. Physical play, I mean, you know, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I just felt, you know, that, that, that's all I'll say in that is that that's been brewing for a while. And my job as a head coach is to fight and protect all of my players and tonight i did that all right let's see if he got it out of his system for tonight's matchup eight o'clock tip off once again spurs and nuggets hey a big treat yesterday we stopped by wagner high school to chat with kiana williams one of their all-time greats and she was all smiles that championship net looked pretty good around her neck sunday she helped stanford win the ncaa championship in her hometown and then tuesday the senior guard says she's entering the WNBA draft. ESPN's latest mock draft has her going eighth overall to the Chicago Sky. That's in the first round. CBS Sports feels Kiana will get drafted 10th overall by the LA Sparks. We asked her if she pays any attention to those mock drafts. I'm human, so yeah, I look at the mock drafts, but I try not to get too caught up in them. Um, this year's draft is, is unique because one of the WNBA teams has four picks, um, and so anything can happen with those four picks. You know, they can trade or they could be drafting for other teams. So um, I try not to look at them, but, you know, I'm human. I, I look at them. The WNBA draft next Thursday night at 6. It'll be held virtually. Georgia guard and Brandeis High School great Gabby Connolly also entered this year's draft.
UTSA football kicked off spring practice last week. After last year, they've got some pretty big expectations. They went 7-5 overall last season, 5-2 in Conference USA, earned the program's second-ever bowl game, 31-24 loss in the first responder bowl. The running back, Cincy McCormick, was second in the FBS last season with 1,467 yards on the ground. He talked about his individual goals this season. I want to set myself apart. I want to, you know, uh, think of myself at, for the next level. Uh, like I told you, I was talking to Coach Taylor and the stuff that I need to do. I really need to emphasize of running faster. The speed, speed is the biggest emphasis. And uh, I think that, you know, getting my my balance right, my, my cuts right, just from the little details, just sharpening up myself and getting my mind prepped for the next level. Yeah, spring training is going to help all those guys get better. Yeah. I just want normal seasons. That's all. We can do that. We can go back to that? I hope so. All right. We are learning more about the allegations concerning security failures ahead of the January 6th insurrection. What a watchdog group is revealing in a new report. Boeing facing more issues with some of the planes they've got while it's contacting customers already. Two more mass shootings making national headlines just as President Biden is taking the stage to talk about gun laws. ABC's Mary Alice Parks details the latest in that deadly workplace shooting in Texas and the president's proposals. Employees at this cabinet making business in Bryan, Texas, describing the scene like a horror movie, hiding for their lives in their offices and on the production line. I was painting with my co-worker and I, I heard... Uh... I heard like boom, 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 boom. Bullets tearing through the office complex. Police on the scene in just six minutes, finding one victim dead, four others shot and wounded. So far we have one shot in arm, one shot in back. The gunman gone, police pursuing him across county lines. The suspect, Larry Bolin, an employee of the business, reportedly shooting a Texas state trooper during the confrontation. He has been life flighted to St. Joseph's Hospital in Bryan. Less than 24 hours earlier across the country, another tragedy. Five people killed in a shooting rampage in South Carolina. The victims, a repairman, a prominent doctor, his wife, and two grandchildren. One more injured on the scene. The suspect, former NFL player Philip Adams, later died by suicide. Standing before the country, President Biden calling gun violence an epidemic. It has to stop. The White House moving on executive actions to limit and regulate so-called ghost guns that can be bought online, as well as stabilizing braces that can make pistols more deadly. Republican leaders predicting long fights in court and calling even these modest measures an infringement on constitutional rights. The president arguing back. Today we're taking steps to confront not just the gun crisis, but what is actually a public health crisis. Nothing, nothing I'm about to recommend in any way impinges on the Second Amendment. According to the Gun Violence Archive, not including suicides, more than 19,000 people died by gun violence in the U.S. last year. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Washington. The U.S. Capitol Police watchdog alleging more security failures ahead of the January 6th insurrection than previously known. They're contained in a preliminary report by the Capitol Police Inspector General. It says when riders stormed in, the shields used by a police civil disobedience unit were practically ineffective because they were not stored properly. Some ammunition in the police armory expired. For the first time, the report also points out Capitol Police did not fully utilize an intelligence warning. It came from Homeland Security in late December, and it said that bloggers on a pro-Trump website talked about underground tunnels used by lawmakers. The inspector general is expected to testify in Congress next week about the report. Boeing says it has now informed 16 of its customers that they need to address a possible electrical issue in certain 737 MAX aircrafts before they use them any further. Boeing made the recommendation today after discovering the electrical problem. It did not specify how many aircraft could be potentially impacted by that recommendation. This is just the latest problem for Boeing's MAX planes. They were grounded for nearly two years following a pair of crashes that killed more than 350 people. The FAA lifted the order last November after Boeing fixed the flight's control system. 
Youth sports and after school activities appear to be causing COVID-19 clusters. That's according to the CDC after several coronavirus outbreaks have been linked to school tournaments or extracurricular activities. CNN's Steve Nams has a closer look, including recommendations from health experts to keep kids safe. Youth sports may be one factor fueling the latest spread of COVID-19. The CDC now says youth tournaments and extracurricular activities are creating clusters where coronavirus can spread among children. We're working to facilitate increased testing that is happening um, on the ground in the context of youth sports. Health officials say as kids continue to play indoor sports like basketball, hockey and wrestling, it's causing an increase in COVID-19 cases in some parts of the U.S. We are seeing a higher proportion of younger people who are getting ill and unfortunately getting hospitalized. In Florida, the CDC reports the virus was linked to high school wrestling tournaments in December where 38 people were infected. And in Minnesota, officials there say the B117 variant, first found in the UK, spread through one county where at least 68 cases were linked to youth sporting events. School sports, particularly team sports, which people engage in close contact without masks, I think that is what is explaining these surges of cases in young individuals. So what do you do if you have kids in sports? The CDC recommends minimizing the time spent indoors and reduce the amount of time players spend in close contact with each other. For today's Health Minute, I'm Steve Nannis. Health experts also recommend having children play outdoors whenever possible and not share water bottles. The B117 COVID variant was originally found in the UK and is about 50% more infectious than any other strain of the virus, according to researchers. Taking a look outside with live cam. It is Friday. Y'all made it. 81 degrees out there. It's going to be the warmest day of the week, too. We're going to end on a hot note, but the good news, the weekend looks really nice. A little windy tomorrow morning, but other than that, really pretty nice. Forecast high temperatures today, toasty. We've been waiting for this, right? Temperatures in the upper 90s this afternoon, 96 here in San Antonio, maybe up to 97. You're going to see some triple digits down to the south, places like Laredo, and uh, getting as high as 103. But the northern part of the state... Well, they'll, they'll already be influenced by that front, so it'll be a little bit cooler up there. 68, the expected high in Amarillo today. So big spread in temperatures thanks to a front. We also have a dry line in play, too. Outside right now, mostly clear skies. Temperature is at 79. Dew point is at 66. We're waiting on that number to drop. We still have southerly winds at about 9 miles per hour, but westerly winds should kick in later today. Red flag warnings also in effect out west where winds are going to be gusty. Humidity levels could be as low as 7%, so areas... West of I-35 will have a threat for fires today. You got to be careful with this kind of weather. Forecast for the weekend, 83 tomorrow, breezy, low humidity, 88 on Sunday. We may see a few thin high clouds late in the day, but again, a really good weekend headed our way. Maybe some rain chances next week. We'll discuss that here in a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Today in court, it could be the most important in the Derek Chauvin murder trial and the death of George Floyd. The medical examiner will be taking the stand as prosecutors try to prove that Chauvin's actions did kill Floyd. ABC's Rena Roy has more. Today, key players in the high profile murder trial taking the stand once again. This is a death where both the heart and lungs stopped working. And the, the point is that it's due to law enforcement subdual restraint and compression. Thursday, gripping testimony from breathing and lung expert Dr. Martin Tobin, having jurors touch their necks as he explained how he believes Derek Chauvin's actions made it impossible for Floyd to breathe due to multiple factors, including Floyd's body pressed against the pavement, handcuffs being in the prone position, and Chauvin's knee on his neck, back, torso, and arm. The cause of death is a low level of oxygen. The doctor pointing to Chauvin's body position in this image. The toe of his boot is no longer touching the ground. This means that all of his body weight is being directed down at Mr. Floyd's neck. Also explaining just how much Floyd struggled using his hands to try and survive. You see his knuckle against the tire. This is extraordinarily significant because this tells you that he has used up 
his resources and he is now literally trying to breathe with his fingers and knuckles. A healthy person subjected to what Mr. Floyd was subjected to would have died. The defense argues Floyd's drug use and heart issues led to his death. An emergency medicine physician testified there's no evidence of that. He is saying, you know, please, please get off of me. I want to breathe. I can't breathe. That is not a fentanyl overdose. That is somebody begging to breathe. Prosecutors only have to show that Chauvin's actions were a substantial causal factor, even if other issues contributed to Floyd's death, according to Minnesota guidelines. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Childhood best friends who reunite as unlikely superheroes in a new movie. A preview of this action comedy still ahead in the spotlight. Data from several thousand LinkedIn view, view users rather posted on a popular website with hackers. It's now up for sale. However, the company says it wasn't hacked. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Hello, everyone. This is your Daily Tech and Business Briefing from Cheddar. Bank of America is showing some appreciation for their bankers as the U.S. Bank will reportedly increase the salaries of their junior investment bankers starting May the 1st. According to Reuters, this comes after a busy year fueled by the broader SPAC deal boom. It comes just a few weeks after analysts over at Goldman threatened to quit. That was due to harsh working conditions. Meanwhile, Nike has reached a settlement with that shoemaker behind those controversial Little Nas X Satan sneakers. You might remember Nike filed a lawsuit against Mischief for ripping off their Nike Air Air Max 97s without a proper partnership. As part of the settlement, Mischief had to initiate a voluntary recall to buy back any Satan shoes for their original retail price. And Elon Musk's Neuralink co-founder Max Hodak says he could build the real Jurassic Park if he wanted to. Inspired by the film, the model could potentially include genetically engineered dinosaurs created by the Neuralink software. While Hodak never confirmed plans to build out the model, he seemed to be implying that it's possible. And that's your Cheddar Business to Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado, coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. I think people would actually go to Jurassic Park if it was real. No way. Yeah, they would. Professional networking site LinkedIn says it has not been hacked, even though data from about a half a billion users has been posted for sale online. The company says the post was made on a, pop oh, on a website that's popular with hackers, but according to LinkedIn, the information was taken only from users' public profiles. Some of the data was collected from other websites, and the company says it did not see any private information in the post. A cybersecurity site says the information includes users' names, emails, phone numbers, and professional titles. You wouldn't go to a Jurassic Park, would you? I've seen the movie. I don't think it's a good idea. No. I, I'm going to... Especially if they escape, you know? Yeah. Not a... Not a I, no. It's, it was, if it was there, I bet somebody would go. But it blows my mind that they even think they can actually do that. Yeah. Weird. 79 so far today. That is the average high. The record is 99. We think that we could get close to that, although we've got to gain another 20 degrees for that to happen. So and we probably won't quite get there. Hot day nonetheless. Cool down for the weekend. Some rain chances next week. That seven day forecast is coming up. Live look outside shows you it's hot, humid, and a little bit of everything gonna get worse. Ooh. <laughs> Probably so. It, we have a wide range of weather going on today, I'd say across here. So we're gonna break it up geographically. Let's look at some of the headlines here. So we're looking outside, mostly sunny skies. We'll start with San Antonio. And uh, what we're looking for is record challenging heat. We'll go out west. This is where we run into some really dry air, potentially triple digits. And there is a fire threat because of some gusty west winds off to the east for some of our far eastern counties. Humid and stray severe storm will be possible, although the potential of that is low. If we were to see a storm fire up, though, it likely would be strong to severe. There's a look at the satellite picture. Most of the cloud cover is shifting out of San Antonio. Still a few left over clouds here. Temperatures on their way up. 79 at Randolph, 79 skiing, 83 in New Braunfels, 85 pleasant in one of the warmer spots. Zooming out some 86 in Kennedy, 87 down there in Laredo. So things are starting to get 
cranked up now. You'll see these numbers, especially out west, rise really fast. We'll jump into the 90s here uh, probably pretty soon. High temperatures today up around 97 here in San Antonio. At least that's what we're thinking. We're a little behind schedule, but we should at least get close. 100 in Hondo, 100 Pleasanton, and triple digits down to the south and west. This will be some record challenging heat as we showed you uh, before the break there. Uh, the record today is 99 here in San Antonio. The relief comes tonight. Cold front works through and by tomorrow morning, this is 7 o'clock, we're down into the 60s. Hill Country is in the 50s. That'll feel a lot better. And then tomorrow, only 80s for highs. So uh, quite a bit of a cool down. And we'll get some gusty winds, at least for the first half of the day on Saturday. And then the winds will calm down some. We do have severe weather underway across far northeast Texas. Severe thunderstorm warnings now being posted uh, into parts of uh, Texas and Arkansas. And a severe thunderstorm watch box that includes parts of Louisiana. That's where I think a lot of the severe weather will be today. But there is a dry line that is going to progress east. And that draws in that drier air. Remember, we talked about really dry air out west, gusty winds. And then on the other side of the dry line, you have very humid air. We're going to get some lift. And so there could be a storm or two right along the dry line later today. But the, again, the main threat is going to be up across parts of Louisiana, Arkansas, over towards Mississippi. There is a marginal risk, Dallas down towards Houston. Then on the back side of that uh, dry line, where the dry air is, we have red flag warnings for the threat of wildfires. Humidity as low as 7% this afternoon. You're starting to get into some dangerous territory there, so if any sort of fire would spread pretty quickly. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Forecast calls for that dry line to move just east of San Antonio. We mentioned that right along the dry line, we could see an isolated storm or two. We saw that yesterday, by the way. One storm fired up right around Waco, made its way to Bryan College Station where it dropped. Golf ball size hill, maybe a little bit larger. So similar setup today, but I think any sort of storm activity is probably going to be to our north and east. Tonight, here comes the front. No rain with the front, gusty winds, and then we cool down, as we mentioned, going into tomorrow. So the forecast for today, up to 97 for a high, 93, 7 o'clock, 83, 10 o'clock. Westerly winds kicking in for a time, and then northerly winds tomorrow. 83 on your Saturday, 88 Sunday. And then next week, the pattern does become a little bit more active. We have a frontal boundary to work with, and so that should present some rain chances. Right now, 20% chance Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, with a little higher chance Thursday. We'll keep you posted, and it will be cooler, too, which will be nice, guys. Yes, sir. Thank you. At 97, it's too hot too early. A believed character makes an appearance in a new clip from the upcoming Ghostbusters sequel. That's coming up in the spotlight. Two childhood best friends become superheroes to save Chicago in a new action comedy flick. CNN's Rick Damagella talked with the cast of Thunder Force. I've been developing a genetic platform that will allow us to give ordinary people superpowers. But do me a favor, please. Don't touch anything. God, Lydia, do you have any idea what you've done? Melissa McCarthy and Octavia Spencer suit up as unlikely superheroes in Thunder Force. I am all powerful! Did I just read my groin? The stars had different opinions about the difficult stunts. Yeah, I found that to be a challenge, to be honest. It's not just doing it, but doing it and looking good doing it. And I learned that Melissa loves wire work. It's very difficult. If it's difficult to get her to stop doing really great ideas for jokes to finish scenes, it's even more difficult to get her off of wires. I love the challenge of getting a stunt right is months of preparing and such teamwork. You know, it's like you just nobody, no one person can do it. How can we not stop two chicks in their 40s? That smell. It's the suits. We can't wash them. The set was a break from reality for the stars. It's so fun to have all those guys. I mean, this was this was like a family reunion. So to be in the presence of all of those people on a project that really uh, says a lot about where we are in society and what we need right now, it was it was a dream come true. Thunder Force, remember it. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella.
And how about this newly released clip from the upcoming Ghostbusters sequel? It features Paul Rudd, who will star in Ghostbusters Afterlife. But more importantly, it also suggests the reappearance of arguably the most beloved star of the franchise, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. The fluffy nemesis doesn't just make a cameo in the clip. He's the main attraction, and it's not just him. A virtual army of mini marshmallow men let loose in a grocery store right in Aruba and turning each other into s'mores. The film was due in theaters November 11th. I think Paul Rudd's a good addition to that. You think so? Was Bill Murray in this one? I don't know. Man, what's going on? There should be at least Bill a cameo, Murray? right? I hope so. Man. Let's head over to SA Live. We've got uh, two. You know what day it is? Oh, we are celebrating a National Unicorn Day, and Lori Avila McDonald, owner of Addy Bear Sweets, is going to impress you with a treat that you can make at home too. But first, look at what she's doing right there. It's coming out in rainbows. That isn't how did you do that? Um, so you get different buttercreams and you color them separately and you put them in a bag and then you grab your saran wrap and you place it down and you just pipe colors in a row and then you roll it up, twist it up and pipe it or put it in a piping bag. <laughs> Just like that. It's that simple to do. Yeah. And wait till you see. I mean, look at how beautiful and delicate these cakes and treats are. They're too pretty to yeah. eat. But oh. We'll taste them. And Jen <laughs> is 20 stories high above the river walk. What's it look like up there, Jen? Oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. Did I tell you I'm scared of heights, but it's still beautiful. Yes, yeah, so here's a look at the menu at the Moon's Daughters. I'm gonna put this down and maybe I could see Kesa. I think they set it up where I could see Kesa. This view is unbelievable. Ah, no, you can't see the whole thing because we're gonna show you the view. You gotta watch SA Live to see the full thing. So stick around and we're cooking too. Cocktails also. Oh. Uh, well, hey, if you're looking game? for love, yes, get ready to meet these two precious heartbreakers. We're playing the doggy match game to see if they're the right fit for your family. And I'll tell you what, the price is right to mention other game shows with all these. That and a whole lot more coming up on SA Live on this Friday. Stick around.